Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We don't come in our own power, our own desires, our own wants, will. We know it's your will, Father, to have church. It's your will for us to gather together. And Lord, for this short season of time, we'll be obedient. Oh Lord, don't, don't let them push us too much. And so God, we just thank you now. We thank you, Father, that there's going to be a solution, a solving of this calamity within American and American churches by this whatever it is that's floating around. I'm not even going to repeat its name. It's not even worthy to repeat its name. And can I just say this to you, Father? I'm going to prophesy to this group of people. It will come fast, faster than when the healing will come faster than when it came, and it will be easy easier to get healed and faster than it was before. And we f thank you, God, for the simplicity of the power of God that'll heal the people in the name of Jesus. We thank you for making the word alive to us tonight, God. We'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. I like to say, bless all the churches that are gathering tonight. God, I don't know, maybe you've got 5,000 out there, but I know we're here, and I don't know about the others. So if they're out there, bless them also, Father. In Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout. And it's got to be a shout because there's only a hundred of you. So let's do this. A great big shout. We shout what? Amen. Man, that's louder than when you have a thousand. You did great. Tonight, I just wanted to take you somewhere that it's just such a, I had such a ministry today with the spirit of God that I actually had, I actually had a, a I actually had a crazy day. It's one of those days that you know, it's when you're with God, the day just went blue right by. And uh, that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes I'm laboring, you know, trying to get a message and that one doesn't fit and it feels like a pair of shoes, it's too small and you know that's the message and it's not the message and you gotta do But today was different. Today was just the presence of God all day long and I just sat in a chair and had a great time with the Lord. I want you to go with me tonight. God gave me a special message for you tonight and for you tonight. That's why you should be listening. And go with me to Mark in the fourth chapter. I want to talk to you about something. Before we read from Mark, the fourth chapter, I want to give you a title of the message and then I want to explain the title of the message because it really doesn't make any sense if I just give you the title of the message and you get a title, but, but do it as a reference, but then let me explain what it means a little bit. Misplaced authority leads to misplaced faith. Let me say it again. Misplaced authority, think about what that is like, and I'll, I'll explain it to you, leads to misplaced faith. And uh, a lot of times we don't understand that word authority. Authority is a great word. I'm going to put it up on the overhead uh, for you, and it's uh, uh, just a, a great word, authority. Uh, if you could guys put, pop it up, I don't know if you can pop it up or not. I know you're in order and all that stuff. Authority, the power or right to give orders and make decisions to enforce obedience. And when something is in your life that does this, listen to this, is becomes a power or something that manipulates you or moves you to do something different, that's considered biblically to be a type of an authority. And it says a power to do right, or by the way, authority can also do, be some power that does wrong in your life, that causes you to operate not just right, but wrong. A power or right that they have to give orders and to make decisions. And the one who makes the decisions is the orders come and then the decisions are made on your part and it's called authority. And it says to enforce obedience. So misplaced authority leads to something. It leads to misplaced faith. Misplaced faith leads to literally destruction in your life, your family, your home, family, children, finances, everything. Leads to everything. Leads to complete 
economic chaos, leads to physical chaos, leads to what we have in our society today, fears that have gripped the people, sicknesses that are running wild, people don't understand, people can't even buy toilet paper in the stores. What's that all about? My goodness, go try to eat toilet paper. And uh, you know, that's just like the nuttiest thing in the world. The, the world has just gone, does anybody agree with me? It's just kind of like gone crazy out there uh, over something. So an authority came in and spoke and put fear in the people in such a way that they're operating without proper guidance. So misplaced authority leads to really bad misplaced faith. And I want to share that with you. I was just talking to the Lord today. He took me to Mark 4 chapter, so I'm taking you there. And what we have here is just a short few verses that really tell a great story. And the verses are found in Mark, the, if you will, the fourth chapter. And as we look at this, we see something taking place. You remember the story, maybe some of you knew or, and don't remember the story, but let's just talk about it for a, for a few moments. This is when Jesus has been ministering all day for a couple of days. And uh, he's been speaking parables to the people and he's never spoken anything to the people except through parables because they couldn't understand anything in this particular situation. At the end of the day, he's exhausted. His guys are absolutely wiped out. And he says, hey, let's go to the other side, talking about the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of uh, Nisestra. And so we find him going to the other side, a bunch of little boats tag along. And uh, Jesus is found in this spot where he has put his head down on a pillow in the back of the boat. You know the story, if you, if you know anything, it's only, only described to all of us many times. And he's asleep in the, in the, in this, in this storm comes up and the winds come up and the floods come up and it starts flooding into the boat and they're starting to capsize, they're starting to sink and something takes place. In fact, let's go back and let's read the scripture because what you're gonna see here is such an amazing truth that'll help you in today's world that you're facing. Is that a good deal? I think it is. In Mark the fourth chapter, verse number 37, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filled. So here's this verse that comes along telling us it's a windstorm. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention to you that the Spirit of God spoke to me is God could have said it was a great earthquake, put him in an earthquake situation. But there's a great windstorm. Windstorms on a lake this size, if you will, uh, uh, of the Galilee, which is like an ocean or a sea, is very common. The waves are very common. And when I was just meditating that, why isn't it an earthquake or some other thing besides a, a windstorm with big waves? Why isn't it some, an earthquake could come along one time in your life or maybe for most of the world have never even experienced a, if you will, an earthquake. But a windstorm, everybody's experienced and they come and then they go and they come and then they go and they come and they go. And the point being that God was pointing out to me, and I want to point it out to you, is that in your life, you're going to be facing troubles over and over and over again. There's a lot of them that'll be dealt with, solved, but another one comes up somewhere else. For an example, this church, it's amazing that it was alive for as long as it was. And, you know, Debbie and I were talking about it over the last few weeks, how many things we've gone through, numbers of things we didn't even mention. But, you know, when we first started the church, we had about 225 people in the church, and we were really excited about the church growth. And I'll never forget, all of a sudden, Bill Clinton was put into office. One of the first things he did is he shut down Norton Air Force Base and 50,000 jobs in this area were instantaneous within 30 days eliminated. Our church went from 225, 250 people to like 110 people. We did not know how we were going to make it. It was like one of the greatest shocks. It's like what's happening right now. It's a shock. But then you think, well, we stuck in there and the church grew and we got through that. Then, you know, we went through two. 
uh, big viruses during the time of the Obama administration. We fought two of them and still had church and still got through it over and over again. In the middle of that, or in the, if you will, in the beginning of all of that, was the Great Recession, where everything was falling apart economically. I mean, just absolutely falling apart. Over and over and over, we had to battle. Over and over and over, a windstorm will come up in your boat. And if you don't get the patterns down and realize how to deal with these storms of life that come, you know what the one is called today? It's a storm of life that will come, it will pass, hear me now, what I'm going to say, and then there will be another one that comes after that, all trying to stop you, all trying to you to get you to a place where you miss place, mistrust, mislead that authority figure in your life and place him somewhere where you shouldn't place it. So here's Jesus. He's in the back of the boat. The storms have come up. Listen to what it says in verse number 38. But he was in the stern, sleeping. Notice the capital H in the word he. He was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, I've always thought of this as a weird thing to say to him. They didn't call him Lord. They didn't call him the son of God because shortly after this, he stops them and buttonholes them and says, Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter, who do you say that I am? And he says, well, you're the son of God, the Messiah, the, uh, you know, and he says, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. And it's kind of funny how they called him this word teacher. He had been doing that all day long over and over again. They didn't call him God. They didn't call him Lord. They didn't call him the Messiah. They didn't call him the Christ. They called him teacher. And then they make a statement as they woke him up. They said to him, teacher, do you not care that we perish? I always thought it was a group of people in the boat, his disciples, that were talking to Jesus, listen to this, about them perishing. But they have included Jesus in this perishing. Are you not interested or don't you care that we are, and we are meaning all of us in this boat perishing, not just us and you not to, you're going to perish too, Jesus. And that's why they called him teacher at this time instead of Lord. They forgot the authority that they had seen. They had seen the miracles. They had seen the word. They had walked with him day after day. They saw the crowds everywhere he went. People were miraculously healed. They knew it. They saw it. But this particular time, because the storm came up that challenged who he was, the problem came up that challenged who he was, they found themselves in a place of compromise and misplacing the real authority for the storm that spoke into their life and told them what to do. And we are not any different today. All of a sudden, so many of us call ourselves Christians, and that's true. I'm not here to judge whether you are or not a Christian, whether you're strong in faith or not strong in faith. Who am I to? judge that. I'm not here to criticize you or anything. I love you. God God bless you for coming to church. God bless you for tuning in. I think it's fabulous that you've done that. But sometimes that misplaced authority often will take the authority of the real God whom you serve. And then you start making decisions in your life. And so do I, by the way, it's not just you. So do I. We make decisions based on the new authority that's telling us that our boat's sinking. Is anybody listening to me? And then what happens is really fascinating because Jesus could have said anything to them. But in verse number 39, he makes this statement. In verse 39, let's put it up. It says this. And then he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, be peace, be still. And the wind ceased and and there was a great calm. And so he arose and he speaks and he says, Peace be still. At this very moment, you got to get the picture. Here is God showing his authority over the natural powers of authority of this world. 
The supernatural authorities of this world is God. The natural authority of this world, listen to this, is the things that are around that speak to you every day. They're telling you don't do this, don't do that, can't do that, can't do that. And that's all fine for a while. That's all fine for a season until it gets out of hand, until it gets a little crazy. And we get back to the place where we're saying, my goodness, this is not about the authority of anything except the authority of God, which brings me back to my faith. And Jesus makes a statement in verse number 40. He says these words. He says, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? Here's this whole country grabbing every piece of toilet paper they can get a hold of. I mean, you talk about insanity, that's insanity. You know what I'm saying? Why are they so fearful? Why would somebody be fearful unless the authority figure in their life was no longer the one who is the real authority, but the world around them, the natural world speaking to them? Is anybody getting this at all? He says, why are you so fearful? And he's not doing that because he doesn't know. He knows exactly. I believe he went to sleep exactly in that boat for this very reason. I wouldn't doubt if you get to heaven that he called up the storm just to point out to them and to you and I that we're gonna have storms all the time in our life. We're gonna be in the boat. And so why are you so fearful? It's because you looked at the authority of something else other than God. Yep. And you're now being run by the authority of the natural world instead of being run by the natural of the, uh, and remember I said this, misplaced, if you will, authority leads you to something misplaced. What? Faith. Notice what he says to them, and so fascinating. How is it that you have no faith? You know, he very seldom uses the terms no faith. There's a little faith, small faith. There's mustard seed faith. There's great faith. There's supernatural faith, spiritual faith, but no faith. It actually took them by watching and keeping their eye on the problems of life that were coming into their arena, the boat, actually took them and put them somewhere. You know where to put them? In a place of no faith. When you're in no faith, you're subject to what the world has to say. All of a sudden now you've let your guard down. Because right. if you think you're going to get anywhere with God, doesn't the Bible say that there's no other way to please God but by how? Faith. And he that comes to God must believe that he is what? God. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently do what? Seek him. That's Hebrews the 11th chapter, verse number six. And so all of a sudden, if faith is what this is really all about. And it is something that we don't often see or understand. God is looking for a people who will keep him in the midst of their boat sinking as the authority figure of their life and not compromise who the authority is. And will, he's looking for a people who will not only keep God as the authority of their life, but also stay in faith, which activates the blessings that God wants to bring to you in the midst of the boat sinking. Does God have the power to deal with whatever situation he speaks? And the oceans settle down, be still, and it was still. My goodness sakes alive. Who has the authority now? And do you remember when Jesus went back to his own hometown and the Bible says that he could not do any great miracles there because of unbelief? Why were they unbelieving? Because they had known him from the past. They knew who he was. They knew his mom, his dad. They knew he was a carpenter. They saw him as a nobody instead of seeing him as an authority figure. And when they stopped seeing Jesus as an authority figure and called him teacher, that should have been an eye opener for all of us that they have just changed and misplaced the right authority. Wow, fascinating. The New Testament is different than the Old Testament. The other day I was listening to a 
minister who was talking on a verse, and it was a great verse, and he brought it up in Joshua, the first chapter, in verse number nine. I want to read the chapter to you, and then I want to show you how the Old Testament dealt with the subject of faith and authority uh, compared to the New Testament, which the times that we live in right now. So I'm going to have you turn, if you will, to Joshua, first chapter. And when you get to Joshua, the first chapter, verse number nine, it's really kind of powerful. Let's take a look at it together. Now, if you haven't found, if you find Deuteronomy, just go past Deuteronomy to Joshua, the next book back. And if you go to Judges, you've gone too far. In Joshua, the first chapter, verse number nine says this. Verse nine says, have I not commanded you? I mean, is that not an authority figure making a statement there? Is that, uh, hello? Is that not an authority figure? Think about what he just said. Have I not commanded you? In other words, I'm giving you, I'm telling you my authority. Here's what my will is. Here's what I want. He says, I, have I not commanded you to be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. And I love this part. Tell me if you love this part. You'd love this tomorrow to be with you. For, for the Lord, your God, is with you wherever, I love this, you go. When I go to the grocery store, God, God, God's with me. I go to Home Depot, God's with me. Wherever I go, my authority goes with me. Who can still the oceans while my ship is being rocked. Is anybody listening? It's so powerful to see that. How many, raise your hands and at home do this too because it's important that you get involved in this message. Listen to this. How many of you would love that verse to be part of your life? Just raise your hand. Uh, all of us would. I'm going to show you something. That verse is an interesting verse because you'll find something in that verse. It is a promise. I'll be with you forever, wherever you go. That's a promise. But there are conditions to the promise. The promise doesn't work until the conditions are met. A lot of times we don't see that. We don't understand that. That the conditions need to be met in the Old Testament in order for the promise to become alive where God is with us. Proof of that is let's go back and let's take a look at it together. And Joshua, the, the, um, uh, the uh, let's take a look at the seven verses. The seventh verse of Joshua, the first chapter. First chapter, Joshua 7. I'm sorry, jo Joshua 1, verse number 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Only be strong and very courageous. See, if I'm asked, and that's what he said before, if I'm asked to be strong and very courageous, that is a very difficult thing for me to do on my own. But if I'm strong and very courageous because my strength and my courage comes from God. And that's why the word of God says all things are possible to him that was, does what? Believes. Nothing's impossible to God. And so he comes along and he makes statements like this and he makes this statement and it's an interesting statement and we don't really realize it, that what he is saying there is so important for all of us. Be strong and of good courage. Now watch this. That you may observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to the right, do not turn to the left, that you may prosper in everywhere you go. So here's these promises about prospering and doing things, but there's also a contingency right there. And the contingency is that there are conditions that I have to meet in order for this to happen, right? And he comes along in verse number eight, the book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. I mean, that's really a difficult thing for me to go along and constantly have the things that God says coming out of my mouth, especially in a storm. I'm in a boat, uh, the boat's starting to sink. It, the natural is 
overwhelming to me. And I find myself uh, in this area, well, I should be strong and I be, should be full of courage. And it's very difficult to do. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. I've said this to you before. I don't know if you ever really got it, but I hope you get it tonight. There is no strength and there is no incur- uh, courage outside of Jesus Christ. There is, let me say it again, there is no strength and there is no courage that you can muster up outside of Jesus Christ. Your human strength and your human courage will only last for a while until you get worn down and the waves start coming into the boat. Is anybody listening? Yes. And uh, trials and pressures will put it on you until you finally just give up. So when he makes a statement like this, he says, here's a promise. I want to fulfill this promise to you, but there are conditions to the promise. And you say, wow, what's he talking about? How can I fulfill the promise? Can I just say something to you? The disciples that were with Jesus, they knew these scriptures. It was their custom to learn these books, some of which they were taught as children to memorize. They knew about this. They knew about what the blessings were. And they also knew what the the condition was to the blessing the thing that I had to fulfill in order to get the blessing. And it comes along in verse number eight. It says, this book of law shall not depart out of their mouth, but you shall meditate in day and night, and you shall observe it to do according to all that is written in it. For then, see, here it is. Now listen to this. For then, in other words, it, 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 it's not going to happen that God be with you all this time until the then comes into it until the condition is fulfilled. Because he says, and then you will make your way prosperous. That's a promise. But it doesn't come until you, after you've done your part. Watch this. He says, and then you will have good success. So here's the disciples, they're in the boat. I believe they knew exactly what the scripture had to say, or they wouldn't have followed Jesus in the first place. That's just my thinking, but I, I think I'm right about that. And they're saying to themselves, we've done all of that. We've followed God. I mean, we're exhausted by following him. We're working with him. We have our jobs to do as he ministers to the multitudes and the thousands. And we were the ones passing out the food. And we were the ones, you know, getting the guy with the bread and the loaves of fish and the loaves and the bread uh, and the fish. And we were pat- breaking it and praying over and pat- we're working all the time. They actually see themselves as people who have fulfilled, they're in the inner circle with Jesus. They're right there. They're the ones in his boat crossing the the lake together. They're not in the other boats that were out there. They're in Jesus's boat at that moment. And yet they broke down. Why? Because to the promise, there's a condition. Let me show you clearly about the promises. Now I want to make a statement to you in the Old Testament and how different it is in the New Testament. Is that okay? Because that's what we're talking about today. Because you read this, you think, well, there's no hope for me to do all of that in order to get God on my side. Ah, God notices that. The book before the book of Joshua is the book of Deuteronomy. Go with me to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. Is everybody listening tonight? It's so good for us to hear this. Are you following me? Is there any, any, anybody not, everybody following me? I'm trying to be as simple as I can possibly be. And verse number one of the 28th chapter. Now it shall come to pass if, everybody say the word if at home. Come on, say the word if with me. Come on, if. That biggest little word in the whole entire Bible is the word if. It says so much about what's coming up next. So he says, and you shall come to, it shall come to pass that if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, and observe carefully his commandments, in which I command you today, the Lord God will set you on high above the nations of the earth. Verse two, and all these blessings, verse three, blessings shall, verse four, blessings shall, verse five, blessings shall be in your basket. Verse six, blessings shall be when you come in and when you go out. My goodness, blessings after blessings, blessings after blessings after blessings 
passage, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord. They knew that. They saw his miracles. They saw what he had done. They heard him personally minister there on the inner circle with Jesus. And when a storm of life came up, they fell apart. And they transferred what they know to be the greatest authority that ever lived on earth to the authority of the natural world around them. And that's what we're doing right now in America. Is anybody listening to me? And it's such a shame because it's heartbreaking because it's just one of those things. That goes all the way through to verse 15, all the blessings if you do this. Watch this. Verse 15 comes along, Deuteronomy 28, and says this. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully these commandments and statutes in which I command you today and these things cursed you will come in and you will over curse it will overtake you verse 16 curse verse 17 cursed verse 18 cursed verse 19 cursed the rest of the chapter are cursed all because you didn't do anything now I hate to use the word change but between the Old Testament and the New Testament, God hasn't changed. His blessings haven't changed. But there is now a new access, if you will, a new avenue to the blessings of God. And it's no longer how hard you work doing all of these things because they thought they had done that. It was now about something called the right authority that brings great faith. Is anybody listening to me? And that's why we see this in the scripture in Matthew. Go there, Matthew 16, 16 for a moment. Jesus is speaking and he says these words, Matthew, the 16th chapter. And he says, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He asked him, who do you say I am? Verse 17 comes along. Remember I said, Jesus answered and said, blessed you are Simon by Jonah. The flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is heaven. In other words, he actually heard something from God. You and I can hear from the authority of God all the time. And that's what makes us different than the world. Verse number 18 comes along. He says these words. I also say to you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I mean, you got to understand something. That's been our scripture since we started this church. Yeah. On this rock, that's why we called it the rock. The rock is the revelation of Jesus. The rock is Jesus. On this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell. And don't tell me the gates of hell in America haven't come against the churches of the world to this day as I stand before you. And they will not, the Bible says, and they will not prevail against it. That needs to be on the inside of me. Now, where does that come from? It comes from the authority of God himself who spoke it. Had nothing to do with me. Had nothing to do with whether I'm good, bad, indifferent, fulfilling something or not fulfilling something. Because I love him. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my words. Therefore, I want to do those things that he says. Keep the word of God in my mouth. Do all the things that he wants me to. Because I love him. That's just part of my life. I want to live his way, not my way. I want to live for him, not for me. I want to live his want, his pleasure, his desire. Not just for what I want. And he says, I'll build my church upon that. Now watch this. And then it comes along, verse number 19, which is really kind of cool. He says, and I will give you, verse 19 is an amazing verse. I will give, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. What's the keys to the kingdom? You know, sometimes I hear theologians say, Jesus went and he took the keys, Revelations 118, of death and hell. He didn't give those to us. He's got those. The keys to death and hell is different than the keys of the kingdom. Let's talk about the word keys for a moment. He says, listen to these words. I'll give you the keys. Not just a key, 
But the keys, who is he giving it to? His disciples. And he says, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The keys are what unlocks which can't be unlocked. Uh, that is locked. It unlocks what's locked. It opens what is closed. It gets past the barriers of life to where you need to be in order to get the blessings that God has for you. And here's what he makes a statement. He says, he says, and what's, so I used to think whatsoever, when you read this, it's in the context of forgiving people. So most theologians say, uh, uh, if you bind these people up, they'll be bound in heaven. If you loose them, they'll be loosed in heaven. And there's, there's a measure, of course, of truth in that, keeping it in context, it really is true. But the word here that throws us all off is this word, whatever you bind, whatever you, whatever means whatever. When this thing wants to come knocking at your door, uh, my door's locked, sucker. I don't care how many crowns you have on your head, my door says, is everybody listening to what I'm saying? You know? Uh, uh, because whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, God backs it. Amen. Whatever you loose, whatever you let go, whatever you open and go through, listen to this, uh, I'll, I'll loose it in heaven, Jesus says. And a lot of times we forget about where the authority now lies. It's still in Jesus, it's still in his eternal word, but here's the deal, Jesus is in me and in you if you're born of the Spirit of God. And his word is the map to the future. And if I substitute him, his authority for the authority that the world's falling apart in, then all of a sudden I now have faith that's failed. Is anybody listening? Yes. To confirm this out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, we go to Matthew, the 18th chapter. Kind of cool. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Let's just put it up on the overheads, please. Matthew, the 18th chapter. And it says this uh, in verse, I think it's Matthew 18, 18, isn't it? Yeah, it says, Assuredly I say to you, whatever, there's that word whatever again. It's whatever, whatever. Why is it whatever? Be, listen, now let me just make it very clear. I have a difficult time thinking that God of heaven is going to back me if my ideas and wants are contrary to his. Let's, let's don't be foolish with this. You know, if my desire, my will, my, I remember I, I told you this story one time when I was a young preacher. I was a young preacher. I was so trying to get out of preaching. It was unbelievable. I, I had I met so many people that were absolutely out of their mind. I think God in the early days, not of this church or the church before, and that he sent everybody that was crazy. And I had a congregation of crazy people. <laughs> And everyone, and this woman comes up to me and says, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven, what you loose on earth. I, I, I want a man and I want that man. And I, and I loose that man to me. I said, that man's married. She says, I don't care. I said, well, God does. Don't be stupid, woman. I, you know me, she didn't come back to church ever again after I said that. And I said, don't be stupid, woman. And, uh, uh, you know, she didn't like that. But guess what? Here's the deal. I have a hard time believing that whatever is whatever I want. It's whatever God agrees to that's his will, his way, his plan. Is anybody listening? Come on. So let's don't go foolish on this thing. But it does say whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. My goodness sakes alive, my friends. All we have to do now in the New Testament is to do one thing, really two things have the right authority because it builds our faith and display faith that changes the world. And that's what God's looking for. Sometimes when pressures come and your boat is being flooded, it could be your job, it could be the worries over your house payment, the hourly wage that you're not gonna get for a while, how are you gonna make your payments because 
you know, everything is shutting down, you're in the restaurant business, or maybe you just started a restaurant in January, which has been millions of them in America. I'm here to tell you something. You stay faithful to who is the authority in your life. And it will bring you to faith. And the God that no longer is expecting a person over there to fulfill these things now lives in us to help us to fulfill these things. Can I say it again? You guys online, listen to this. The God in the Old Testament who was over there that expected us to fulfill these conditions in order to get the blessings, now lives in us to help us, empowers by the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us to get the job done, to get the blessings. But it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen if I lose what is authority in my life and I misplace the right authority. I'm finished for tonight. I pray that you got something out of it. Did you tonight? Come on. So here's how I really should finish by telling you all the stuff that you're hearing right now is coming to a quick end. Faster than when it came, and it came fast. It'll be over with quickly, and God will show you he's God. But there'll be another one coming along. And as long as you get these patterns down, no matter what happens. I remember when Debbie and I first got married, we voted for the nicest guy in the whole world to be president of the United States. He took the interest rates to 20%. The whole world had economic cancer because of that. And then Ronald Reagan came in. Everybody hated his guts, but he healed economic cancer in America. And so it's just a... Problem after problem after problem. Your boat will be filled. You say, oh, why does it have to be that way? Because you live in a broken world that refuses to have the right authority in their life and exercise the right faith.